So in this lecture, we're going to look at a simulation. We briefly started that in lecture seven when we had a differential equation and we created a diagram to represent how that equation works, how different parts of the equation are connected. And uh, this will help us immensely when you want to simulate dynamic systems. If you have a transfer function, the problem with the transfer function is that we only have access to one variable. That is the input. We give an input, you only have access to the output. But there are many intermediate variables in this process that are not accessible through a transfer function. Whereas if you have a simulation diagram, all these internal variables, they are available and you can see them. For example, if you have a mass spring damper system, we have the input as a force, the output could be the position. The speed, uh, if you want to calculate the speed, you need to further uh, process the data. Whereas if you have a simulation diagram, the speed will be available somewhere in that simulation diagram. You can just probe that signal there. And this will help us simulate all dynamic systems that are going to use in this class and create the models in MATLAB and Simulink that will represent these equations in a more visual manner. So let's see how we can represent these equations, these models using simulation diagrams that will later be implemented using Simulink and MATLAB. So our objective today is simple, is to represent a control system using block diagrams to show how the different parts of that system interact and represent transfer functions and dynamic models in general using block diagrams. Let me give you an, uh, an example here. We have a blood glucose control system that uh, is described by the following equations. It's a set of differential equations. And here in these differential equations, we have many different elements in this process. We have the desired glucose level, the required, the current glucose level, the ampl an internal amplifier input voltage, uh, another amplifier input voltage, and an insulin pump pressure. Of course, these amplifiers apparently are controlling the pump. The pump is injecting a certain dose to regulate the glucose level. But how do they interact? How can we go from having these equations that represent individual elements in the system to one single block diagram, to one single simulation that visually represents how these different pieces are connected? That's one application of what we're going to see today. Here is another example. The heart rate control system can be uh, summarized by the following diagram. You see that this is a control system that exists in a, bio, a biological process and it works with a feedback loop. We see many different elements here controlling the heart rate that are interacting, that are feeding information back, that this process has an effect, the information goes back in the cycle and so on. How can we represent now this system in terms of equations? If you have a model for, for example, the um, response of the heart to an input signal, the heart model becomes a transfer function. But if I also have transfer functions for how the lung stretches in response to a stimulus, that is another transfer function that would go in the first block. We can combine many different functions that represent these individual functions in the, in the body and then combine them in cascade to create or to represent this control system that exists inherently in the human body. That's another application. So let's get uh, straight into it. So we want now to represent the relation between variables graphically. That's the main idea. I want to represent input and output relations in the form of a block. We know how to do that with a function. That's what we call the transfer function. In a transfer function, you get an input, we pass that through a function, and you have the output. Now this transfer function will be input into a block, and this block will represent that operation, in this case here. The input is V, we pass that through a transfer function that represents the process and we get the output. That's one element and the odd one, one uh, possibility, the other possibility is a system with multiple inputs and multiple outputs. H of S would represent that system. We give the inputs to it, we calculate the different outputs. Okay, transfer function is in there. Okay. So again, the main idea is straightforward, is to represent the relation between different variables in a system graphically. 
And why are we doing this? Well, we are doing this because we want to see how feedback loops operate, where they come from, how they are part of the process that we are developing. And to do that, let's introduce the concept again. We briefly mentioned this in the, in the first lecture, actually. Let's talk about the concepts of open loop systems and the closed loop systems. Let's say we are developing a system to control the glucose level in, in the blood. We can have two approaches. We can have uh, an open loop approach where we inject a certain amount of substance and we estimate how the body will react to it and then we trust our estimations. Or we can have a closed loop system where we're going to look at the response of the body and then adjust the input, adjust the glucose level as we go so we, that we make sure we reach the outcome we want. So the first one is called an open loop and that's what we have here. We have a simple process to control. The process is given an input. We have uh, a good estimate of how the process would respond to that output and we get an output. So this requires that we know the process precisely. And if you want to do a control system to govern that, then you need to add more blocks in cascade to this. If you want a desired response, we need to design a control logic, let's call that C of S, is a control logic that will determine, for example, the insulin level in the blood. We have an actuator, let's call this A of S, which would be the pump in this case, or it would be whatever mechanism we are using to inject the drug. And then you have the process, which would be the body. And you notice here that the system only goes one way. There is only one flow. There is no feedback. You're not looking at the output and you're not trying to estimate uh, to, to correct for variations in the output. And this is what we call the open loop process. So there are several advantages there are limitations this it's the advantage is that if you know the system perfectly it's a very simple system to put in place but that is not not always the case there are several factors that can change the behavior of the system such as uh, model assumptions we always treat systems as linear even though they may not be there are also other factors acting on this system and these other factors may change this behavior so then we can close the loop instead. If we now close the loop, we see the same controller and actuator that we had acting on the process. But now we have this feedback loop where we are measuring the output of the system with a sensor and using that to control, to adjust the desired output. So you see that what we send to our controller here is no longer the desired response, but it is the difference between the desired response and the current response. Meaning that if we are where we want to be, no action needs to be taken. If we are far from where we want to be, then a large action needs to be taken here. We compare the desired and the actual response, and then you are going to take actions based on the error between them. Right? This is the main purpose of feedback control any feedback and these exist naturally in the human body but we can also add our own layer of feedback control to to control other processes but anything that requires estimation uh that, that requires let's say monitoring of the current state of a variable that we're trying to control is a feedback control system is a closed loop control system the advantage here is that even if the model is not pr uh, fully correct the model maybe has some assumptions here is changing a little bit over time or there are disturbances acting on the system such as external uh, external things that cannot be modeled that are not part of the model the, the closed loop system will take care of them okay, so these are the two differences and each of these blocks can be represented by a transfer function one transfer function for the process one transfer function for the actuator uh, the sensor itself could be a transfer function and the controller is a transfer function that we have to define as designers. So we're going to see how to do that later. Um, but we could think of a very uh, rudimentary controller by just putting a gain K, for example, where we say that the output of our actuator is proportional to the error between the desired and the actual 
uh, outputs. So in the case of the insulin pump, we would have the control how much drug we inject. And we could say that how much voltage here we apply to the actuator would be proportional to the error between the current response and the desired response. Of course, this is this depends on the, the system of interest. But these are possibilities. Let's analyze the blood pressure. Uh, another example here where we have a blood pressure, we want to control the blood pressure, and you know that it drops by 0.1 pascals for every one gram of, of drug. This is very exaggerated, but it's just for, um, for, for an example. So we know that for every zero, one gram, one gram, the blood, um, the blood pressure drops by 0.1 pascal. So if this is the body, then you can represent the body as a very simple mechanism here where we have a gain of 0.1. So if you put one gram of drug, then the actual pressure drops by zero pascal. What if you want to do, to do, uh, make the body drop by 0.3 pascal? And you need to add three grams in the system, right? So this information about how the body responds guides our information about how the controller works, how our decisions are taken. If you want a 0 0.3 uh, Pascal drop, then you need to add three grams, which means that here our logic is simply to divide the desired drop by the response, the, the, the uh, proportional constant that we have representing the body. If you now, so this is one over 0 0.1 is 10. So 0 0.3 times 10 gives three grams, which gives the desired response of 0 0.3. Right. So to work in an open loop controller, we need to know precisely how the body responds. And then we establish our logic based on the inverse model of that. But again, G of S, that a transfer function that here is simply given as a constant 0 0.1, needs to be extremely precise or our logic doesn't work. Whereas in a control loop, a closed loop control loop, the system is the same, but now our controller is actually looking at the error between the desired and the current pressure. And you're going to take actions based on that error. Even though this model may be incorrect, it may be a little off like that, it doesn't matter because we are actually looking at the actual pressure and then adjusting our desired uh, adjusting what we send to the controller here, adjusting what comes out of the controller to the body to reach that point, right? So that's the main advantage there. And when you now represent these functions as transfer functions, we will clearly see how these different elements interact if you put them in a simulation diagram as the one you're going to see today, okay? We're going so to come back to these concepts later, yes. Just uh, just for clarification on my part, um, when it comes to like a closed loop system, um, like a feedback loop is just like a subcategory of a closed loop system. Closed loop in this case is just like, or are they like inter inter? They're the same. They're, They're the, same. the same. Okay. Yes. Cool. All yeah. closed loop Great. systems are feedback systems. Awesome. Uh, Professor, I have a quick question here. Mm -hmm. So, um, for the open loop, uh, yeah. it the relationship always be linear, because in your example, it looks like linear relationship. It can be uh, uh, some other relationship. No, in because we are dealing with linear systems, we need to stick with linear systems. Of okay. course, in, in in practice, in practice is not. We could have a control logic that is not linear. For example open and close a valve. That's not a linear process. This is just two stages, right? Uh, we, most control systems will indeed have no linear logics, but within the context of this course, they're going to stick with the linear. Uh, you we, mean we, we, both, both for the open loop and the closed the loop or just the open loop? Yes, we are going to stick with, everything you're going to do here is linear. In reality, in practice, we may have control logics that are not linear. 
for both cases. Okay, got it, thank you. Um, sorry, just to clarify um, the first question, um, we said that, so, um, so a feedback loop is basically the same as an open loop system? No, as a closed loop. A feedback loop is the closed loop. So uh, this is a good example here. We have, we are measuring the output and you're feeding the output back in the input. Oh, okay, thank you. All right, so this is this makes a closed loop because there is a feedback loop. Okay, got it, thank you. So, but in this case, like you're not actually feeding back like pressure or like, like let's say it was like a, you're feeding back information about the output, basically. Correct, you're feeding back, we are feeding back pressure, uh, but the way we are treating that is that we're just comparing with the desired input. Yeah. That's cool. Right. So these processes, this feedback control systems exist in biological processes. This is one that we added on top of biological process. But if you actually look at the how the body regulates the feedback control system, there is a feedback involved to change the heart rate based on the pressure. Temperature control is the same. And if you call, we send a we send a signal to the body, and then the body does something about it to change the temperature. Balance is the same. We know where we are, and if we are, we have a sensor to tell us um, our position. And then, if you're out of balance, the body will try to correct itself. That's a feedback control system. Right? And there are many others in the body that are, exist naturally in uh, any biological process. Okay, our job now is to, when we want to develop these processes and control them, we need to now come up with transfer functions for each of these put them together to understand how these feedback loops work. And eventually our job will be to design these controllers that will make the process do exactly what we want. Okay, we're gonna get there slowly. So let's see how we can construct this build, this, this simulation diagrams. We're going to represent them as blocks. And I have a certain number of basic building elements that we're going to use throughout the course. And you'll find them in Simulink. I believe you looked briefly at Simulink in the very first lab or the second lab, if I'm not mistaken. And you've seen these blocks there. So let's see um, what you're going to see here will be, be a bit trivial. So the first one is a transfer function. When the block represents a transfer function, we give it an input, we have the output. Input is X, output is Y, G of S is the transfer function. So we can write that y of s equals to the input x of s times g of s. That's how we read this block. Input is x, so x times the function gives the output y of s. Okay. We typically put a transfer function in simulation diagrams in rectangles or squares. The second element is a gain and a gain is simply a constant that multiplies a function so if we have the input as x of s and the output as y of s then y of s is alpha times x of s simple right if our transfer function we'll give an example here if our transfer function is one over s, what are we doing? We take the, the variable x and you say that y is one over s, x of s, which means that uh, y is taken by integrating x of s. One over s is the integral operator in the s domain. If it was simply s, then y would be the derivative of s and so on. When we look at constant gains, we typically use a little a uh, triangle like that to represent, so to do, differentiate them from a transfer function. Transfer functions are always functions of S, whereas gains are simply constants. Okay. The other element is the summation and subtraction that you're going to represent as a circle. So if you have these two elements going into a circle and there are no signs indicated that tells us that we are adding them up. So if the output here is Z, 
we have z equals to x plus y where z and y could be constants could be transfer functions could be variables of interest anything if the bottom here has a negative sign then you can say that z equals to x minus y and if the sign is now around x then z equals to y minus z uh, minus x okay and if there is nothing indicated then it's safe to assume that that's a sum okay in simulink we will actually always see plus plus in textbooks the signal is typically not there unless it's a negative sign okay that's this, the second the third element the fourth element is to combine transfer functions in cascade so if here we have two transfer functions in cascade like that you have the input x the output y we could simply multiply them out when you go through the line like that we are multiplying the signals so this would be equivalent of putting two transfer functions together in the same block which means that y would be x times g of s times h of s okay any questions here uh professor so here yeah. just the two transfer function or any I... any amount okay yeah we could put a gain here in somewhere you put a gain there k and this would be multiplied by k uh but Good. why it could have like a multiple transfer function uh oh or oh i, I got it like we could have different models we could have different elements that are working oh, okay. in cascade and then each transfer function represents a particular element rather than having just one big transfer function we can all see the signal at different stages of that process okay okay got it thank you any other questions no all right so let's do one example here and the example it shows is an, a uh, dc motor why a dc motor the dc motor will serve as actuators in many processes that we want to control if we think about the insulin pump for example the pump has a dc motor in it anything that provides motion has a dc motor in it. a ventilator has a dc motor in it and this is an interesting example because it has a feedback system in it so so we can model a dc motor just do a very simple modeling here with some assumptions as having two parts one is the electrical part and one is the mechanical part the electrical part is simply a coil that goes around uh, a stator and the coil has a resistance and has a inductance as the motor rotates that circuit will experience a back emf a back electromagnetic force electromotive force coming from the rotation and that will be manifested as a source of voltage that it will be applied to this circuit so let's call this vm Professor, yeah. could you redefine for me what a back electromotive force is? All right, so if you take if you take a magnet and you have a coil and you have put a multimeter around that coil. And when you move the magnet, you will see that the coil will experience a change in magnetic field and thus there will be an induced voltage in the coil. Okay. All right, and this is the um, magnetomotive force. Same thing occurs in a motor. When the motor spins, there is a magnet spinning, and mm -hmm. this changing magnetic field generates a voltage in the uh, in the circuit that we use to power the motor. Cool. Right. Thank you. Okay, so that we are going to call that induced voltage Vm. Now let's model this circuit. Let's look at the electrical circuit first. We can simply do the balance of forces here. So Vm. Uh, v of t is v of s is the input is what we apply to control the motor equals to voltage drop across the resistor r times the current plus the voltage drop across the inductor uh, which represents the inductance of the coil lsi and plus this emf force that was created because of the motor rotation from this we can write the current as the V of 
S minus Vm of S divided by our Ls plus R. Now this is the current flowing in the circuit. I just factor out Is, moved Vm to the left side, and then rearrange the equation. Okay, are, are we good here? Yeah? Looks good. All right, so next question is, what is this? What is this Vm? Is the magnetomotive force? And the assumption you're going to make, which holds true for DC motors, you don't need to go into detail, but we can simply say that the faster the motor turns, the greater that a voltage. So we could say that a Vm of S is proportional. Let's call that proportionality constant Km. It's a constant that depends on how we build the motor times the speed of the motor shaft. The faster we spin, the more for our voltage appears there. Okay, this is a constant. Km is a constant and it's intrinsic to the construction of that motor. So now we see here an interesting link. We have an electrical system and the mechanical part, which is the speed. So in theory, we could now replace Km omega s over there. And now we have the current in the motor that depends on the electrical characteristics of the motor, but also on the speed of the motor, that is the mechanical characteristics of it. So now let's look at how we model the mechanical part. We did the electrical part. Let's move on to the mechanical part. So the mechanical part receives a torque. And this is the torque that is created because of your applying current. So that's Lenz law. When you have a charge moving in an electrical field, uh, in a magnetic field, when you have a current in a magnetic field, the current through the wire will experience a force because of the interaction with the magnetic field. It's simply Lenz law from physics. In the context of DC motor, that becomes a torque because it's going to make it rotate. So the current creates a torque. This torque now have to, has to overcome inertia in the rotor, in the motor as it rotates. There's friction in the rotor shaft. And there is also a load torque. Load torque, we're going to call this Td of S, is whatever is connected to the motor, such as uh, a pump or whatever is creating a resistive torque. We call that the load torque. How do we model this now? Well, we can do the sum of all torques equals to inertia times acceleration. What is the acceleration in terms of a speed? That is the derivative of the speed. So omega s times s. Right? Sum of all torques equals to inertia times acceleration. Acceleration, the derivative of speed, which is omega s. Now let's sum of all sum all the torques. We have the input torque coming from the electrical part, that's T of S. We have the, the we have friction. Friction always goes against motion, so minus B omega S, friction around the shaft. We have load torque that is also going against the speed, so T D of S, and this is equal to J omega S S. This guy here can go to the other side of the equation and we are left with T of S minus T D of S equals to omega of S J S plus B. Which gives an expression for the speed as T of S minus T D of S divided by J S plus B. Now we have the speed of the motor. Nothing really complicated here. We have an input torque that is turning the motor. We have a load torque that opposes it. And the denominator, we have inertia and friction, right? Very similar to what would encounter the mass spring damper system, but different elements acting on it. Now, the question we answered before was, we asked before is, what is this VM? What is this magnetomotive force? And the conclusion was, well, that comes from the mechanical part. Now, what is this TD? Well, this comes from the electrical part. This is the torque that the electrical circuit is applying to the motor. 
And again, we don't need to get into details, but it turns out that for DC motors, there is a linear relation between T of S and the current in the circuit. So we can say with confidence that the greater the current, the greater the torque. Now, same with a, with a car in, uh, according to Lenz law, if you have a wire in a magnetic field, the wire has a current through it, the wire experiences a force. The greater the current, the greater the force. Same here, the greater the current through the wire, the greater the torque applied to the mechanical part. And now this links us back to the mechanical part, the electrical part, sorry. Now where the current shows up here. So we could, yes, let me just uh, conclude here one thing. So we could take now this expression as the input torque, replace it here, and now we link the speed with the current. We now go back to the electrical part. Yes, I uh, heard a question. Um, so in the third line, there was, sorry, in the second line, there was B um, omega S. How come when you put it on the other side, it became omega um, it became, sorry, not omega. Like it was, like there are two different symbols. Like how come they became the same? Uh, I'm not sure if I see where the second line. Yeah. So you have the lower B case oh, omega, right. the W, and then. Yeah, so I just wrote omega capital and omega non-capital. Let's just stick with the one, yeah. It's the same omega, I just wrote a capital by accident. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, what did you write, write on this side here? Did they have a great capital? Yeah, here I wrote capital, which is the same as, sorry, omega S, right? To be fair, I, I should have used capital everywhere according to our convention. Lowercase time domain, uppercase frequency domain. Okay, so if sorry. we combine Sir? this equation, yes? Sorry, when you just change that omega S, is that omega S times S? B minus, uh, minus B omega S times S or just omega No, S? this is just omega of S. Okay, right? Because it's, uh, it's B times speed, right? So it cannot be B omega S. That would be B times acceleration, wouldn't, wouldn't make sense. Okay, just checking, thank you. Just uh, one question about the back electromagnetic force. Um, mm -hmm. Does that appear in the mechanical uh, characteristics as well? Because we have the KM, uh, Omega, and then we have B Omega. They are, they are, they are kind of work back and forth. They are part of a feedback loop. Let's maybe do the block diagram and you'll see where that shows up. Okay. See how okay. everything is interconnected. Very good question because now, actually, if you look at these equations, it doesn't really tell us how exactly the motor operates. We have two sets of equations. There is a link, clear link between them, which is the torque and the back EMF force. Let's try to visualize them and create a block diagram. So these are the, we have four equations to consider here. The first one for the current, the second one is the back EMF and the speed. The fourth one is the speed and the torques, the mechanical part. And the last one is the torque and the current. So, here they are, here are all the four equations we just came up with. And now let's try to draw them in a block, uh, block diagram. To start a block diagram, we need to look at the input to our system and try to find the input first. Where is the input to the system? I, here I have VB, it should be VN. What is the input to our system? If we are turning the motor on and we make it spin, what is the input? Uh, v of T. V of T. Very good. V of T is the input, is the voltage we apply to it. Everything else are internal variables. And then what is the output? In this case, it could be the speed. Could also be, depending on what we want to control, could be the position. But let's assume that the output is the speed. So V of S is the input or V of T, and it shows up in the first equation. The first equation here, we have V of S. So let's just type it there. V of S is the input to our system. And if you look at the top of the equation, what are we doing? We take Vs minus Vm. So now let's do that. Vs minus 
Vm of s, that's the top of the equation. And notice now that if you take that result, Vm minus Vs, and divide that by Ls plus R, we get I of s from equation one. We this, what we created here is the top of the equation is V minus Vm. And if we now, according to equation one, if we divide that by Ls plus R, the output is the other side of the equation is I of S. Is this clear? Sorry, can I just ask a question? What was v, uh, Vm of S again? That is the back EMF for uh, uh, voltage that uh, the mechanical part applies in the electrical circuit. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay. Does this make sense? That's the representation of equation one. Yeah, no, perhaps, not sure. So if I don't hear any questions, I'll keep going. So where now we, we are at I of S, where does I of S appear? It appears in equation three, right there. How do we go from I of S to the torque T of S? We multiply that by KI. If we multiply this by KI, this is equation three, and this is T of S, the output. Okay, moving on, where does T of S show? It shows in equation two. How do we know our, our job now is to represent equation two. So we want to go from T of S to omega S. How are we gonna do that? Any guesses? Now we're going to construct that equation. First we write uh, T of S minus T D of S. Right, so let's start by subtracting TD of S, which gives the top of the equation. And now and divided by uh, JS plus B. Exactly, divided by JS plus B. The output here is omega S. Now we are omega. We have omega s that shows in equation four, and it tells us that if you take omega s, we multiply omega s by km, we get bm, which is precisely the signal we needed there to close the loop. Okay, and this is a representation of the DC motor in a block diagram. What can we see here? We see that there is a feedback loop and this feedback loop affects everything in the system. The faster the motor turns, the greater this voltage is here, the smaller that a difference is, the smaller the current, the less torque the motor produces. What else can we infer? We can infer that if the motor is at rest, this feedback loop is zero because the speed is zero. So when we start the motor, Vs goes all the way to the electrical circuit. There is no, uh, there's not no um, voltage against it because the feedback loop is zero. So everything that we have from Vs goes through the circuit that creates a very large current. That a very large current creates a torque. The torque will make the motor rotate. As it rotates, it catches on speed then the feedback loop activates and now this back emf force will subtract from the for the input voltage decreasing the current before it reaches a steady state so that's why when you turn on a dc motor if you just connect it you'll see that at the beginning there is a very high current spike and then later it settles somewhere and this current spike is because the feedback loop when the motor is at rest is deactivated is zero Right? Nothing opposes the voltage input. The current is very high. 
as it starts to rotate, the feedback loop activates. Data voltage is subtracted from the input voltage, and then slowly everything settles at a constant operating point. Okay. Uh, sorry, Professor. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you please tell what the B is again? B is friction in the motor shaft. Okay, thank you. Okay, this is one example. You don't need to understand precisely how a DC motor works. It's just as an example here. Uh, and it's an interesting example because it has a feedback loop. Okay, any, any questions? No? Okay. So I posted a Simulink model that it has DC motor in uh, on Brightspace. You can, in the, this, the module for this lecture, you can download it there and then play with it, evaluate the step response and see what you, you can observe. Notice that here I added an integrator block at the end, just to go to integrate the signal omega s, which is the speed. So if you multiply the speed by one, to the position. Now notice that if we simulate the system as such, we have access to all internal variables. We have the position here, we have the speed, we have the current, we have the back EMF, we have the net torque, we have the net voltage, everything is available there. Whereas if we had a transfer function theta s over v of s, then the only thing that is available in this process is the output. Everything in between is, is not uh, observed. Okay, so this is posted. Uh, take a look at it. You can download it later and uh, play with it. Uh, sorry, Professor. Uh, one question. Can you just mm -hmm. go back? So here, if the um, omega s and the theta s, the uh, transfer function between them is one or s. That means um, the omega s. Uh, I mean, uh, some kind of you can consider the input is the uh, step input. No, the input is all the way here. Uh, there's nothing to do with it. We go theta s equals to one over s omega s. Now, if you look at this portion here which means yeah. that one over S here represents the integral. Oh, okay. Right, remember that the Laplace transform of the integral of X dt is equals to X of S divided by S. Okay, thank you. Right. And if this was S, then it would be the derivative. Okay. All right, so we can say that omega S equals to theta S times S. And so, can you yep. clarify for me again why there is the gain block on the back EMF feedback? So this gain here tells us that the back EMF is proportional to the speed. Right, and you said that. Okay. And that is a proportionality constant that depends on how we build the motor. Right. And same goes for this one. We say that the torque is proportional to the current. And the proportionality constant is ki. Cool. Okay. All right. So let's move on. Now that we have an example of a system, let's see how we can represent transfer uh, functions in, in general. So let's assume equation one. So this is a third order differential equation. We have on one side of the equation here the derivatives of the state, the derivatives of y, the output of the system. And on the other side, we have the input R and different derivatives, different levels of derivative of that input. It's a third order transfer function because the third derivative is the highest one in the input. And then each of these derivatives has a coefficient, A3, A2, A1 for the input B2, B1, B0, uh, sorry, A for the output, B for the input. Okay, let's see how we can simulate this equation. And this equation could represent, it's a generic transfer function that could represent any of the models we have seen so far. 
If you want to solve for this equation, well, the simple approach would be to take the highest derivative here, which is the third derivative, isolate that variable, and then integrate the function three times. And that's what equation two is preparing it for. So notice that the triple dot is missing in your copy there, so add it. So if we, multi we, we move all these elements to the right side of the equation, we divide everything by a3, we get the expression for the highest derivative, which is a y triple dot. Once we have the derivative for y triple, the expression for the highest derivative, we can now integrate the function as many times as needed to now go from y triple dot to y. In this case, we integrate the function three times. Now, right? so we can solve for y of t in theory by integrating this three times. Here we have the expression for that. So in different integration variables to avoid confusion, but essentially what we are doing is simply integrating the whole function three times to get to y. Now, we have integral of derivatives. How do you get rid of the derivatives? Same expression here. How do you get rid of these derivatives? Well, if we take this integral here and make the integral move all the way here, we are passing the inter integral to through two derivatives, the two elements. The first one is the second derivative. The second one is um, first derivative. If we apply the integral to each of these terms, this would be equivalent of shifting the integral all the way to the very last element there that it doesn't have derivatives. We can't keep it going on. And this would cancel out one of the derivatives here, here, and here. All right, so by moving the integral, making the integral is light to the right, every time we pass through one of these elements, we are taking one integral, all right? So r double dot becomes r dot, and you can go to the second element, which was r dot, integrate that, it becomes r, and then the very last element, you notice it doesn't have any integral, so we need to stop there, we cannot keep it going, right? Just to stop here. We can take the second one and keep, doing the same process. We can move it here because the element that we are passing is just before it has derivatives. When, when you do that, we now take the integral and we eliminate the derivative. So that element can move one step ahead and eliminate that derivative. We cannot move any further because everything else doesn't have derivatives. We have to stop here. So this integral is applied to this term and this term here. All right, we just moved one step ahead, so just past the first term there. This is to say that this entire expression can be rearranged as that. Notice that when you took the integral from both sides of the equation, y triple dot now becomes y, All right, because we integrated three times each side of the equation. And what did I do here again? I took this integral, integrated this term, and integrated that term. But this term here is still being integrated by that. So I moved the integral just in front of it. So this integral now only applies to that term. Every other terms have already been integrated by. The second integral goes the same way, but it can only integrate now one term, so it just moves one step ahead. It is integrating this term and is integrating this term as well. And then the very last integral needs to stay where it is because it is still integrating the whole function. So this integral integrates this element, this element, and that element. This, element, this integral does this and that. And this integral integrates this one. It's the same representation, but you see that we now is slowly eliminating the derivatives. And the last equation that we have here has no derivatives, only integrals. That's what was, and that was our goal. Is this clear? Is this process 
Is this what process clear? Could you just go over it uh, one more time? Yeah. So. We have triple integral of a double dot plus b dot plus c. This is equivalent to, so this integral is taking integral of all this, right? We can do the same as integral of integral of a dot plus b plus integral of c. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense to me. Thanks. Yeah. We can go one step ahead and I'll write integral of A plus integral of B plus double integral of C. Yeah? Yeah, okay, that makes that makes a lot okay. more sense. Thank you. All right. But we I'm not writing the second saying that this integral is part of this one. Right? It has an integral and then it's in another integral. Right? But those are equivalent. Any other questions here? No? One more time? Are we good? I'm good, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, if there are no questions, I'll move on. So this is now the expression we got. Remember that, be very careful with the notation here. Look at how this integral integrates the whole function. This integral integrates two elements. The last integral only integrates this, right? But that element in red is now being integrated three times by each of these integrals. The second element here is being integrated two times. And this element is being integrated only by the first integral. Okay. So here we have our input, our, here we have our output, y. This is the, one, the element that has the highest number of integrations. It's going to be integrated three times to get to y. So let's start with there. Let's start in the integral, in the element with the highest integration. And this now needs an input to simulate that we need an input r. Let's put this in time domain, r of t. If we take r of t, we need to multiply that by b0, all right, this term there. And we subtract i0 times y of t, which is the other element. We basically created this part of the expression. Now, this whole thing is subjected to an integral. So we can put an integral block here. In the time domain, we write the integral sign. In the frequency domain, one over s would suffice. Okay. This entire thing is added to that, which is also integrated. So this entire thing is added to. b1 times r, r we can get from here. So this is r of t, this is b1 r of t. And we subtract a1 y of t. We'll see where we find that signal later. And then this whole thing is in a integral. It's the second integral in the middle. This entire thing is now added to 
the signal that comes here is B2 R of T. <coughs> Excuse me. And we subtract I2 Y of T. So B2 is a gain like that. And then R we can get from here. This whole thing is in a integral. And now once we integrate this part, we are left with the entire expression on the right. right? And if you now divide that by one over, by multiply that by one over A3, which comes from this element, the output here is finally Y of T. And now that we have Y of T, we can connect it back to each element. You notice that this one here is simply A2 times Y of T. The middle one is A1 times Y of T. And the last one is A0 times Y of T. And here we have the formulation for the entire thing. Um, sorry, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. uh, why do we, um, why did we write, um, for example, uh, B zero R R of T as B zero R of lambda in R equation? <coughs> Excuse me, that is just for to change the variables in the integration. It's just a mathematical convention, but it's oh. all functions of all functions of time. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Just a so quick question one. about the diagram. Um, mm -hmm. Is that character on the far left, the very first input, is that lambda of t? No, it's r of t. R of t, okay, thank you. Yeah. Now that's the input to the, if you look at the differential equation, we started from equation one, the left, the right side of the equation is the input is R and we have R and it's on derivatives. Okay, got it, thank you. Okay. All right, so this holds for pretty much every differential equation. And now we have access to all the points along the way, here, all the internal variables. And notice, for example, that the signal uh, R of T times B is going indeed through three integrations before it gets to y. You see that? We take the signal here. Let's look at the, the, the equation. The equation states that to go to y, that a b0 r of t needs to be integrated three times, right? because there's three integrals in cascade. Here's our y of r of t. Multiply that by b0, and then the signal is here. And this signal travels towards y of t, and in the process of going to y of t, it is indeed integrated three times. So this is obviously pretty complicated, but like, I, I think I will get it, but I'm trying, what I'm trying to, like you said just now that um, this holds for all cases of mm -hmm. kind of systems. What does that, like, what does that mean? If you look at the differential equation we started from, this is a very generic differential equation. Right. All differential equations will fall into this category. This is a bit more complicated than what we have done to this point because typically these derivatives were zero. But right. this generic expression here so holds for any transfer function, any differential equation. Right. right? Derivatives of the input, derivatives of the output. So it will always come to this. Now, how big is it? It depends on the order. It depends on all the other elements that are present or not. It will come to this in the sense that it will, like, this is the general kind of yep. view of it, but the actual, like, inputs and whatever, like, variables will vary, is what you're saying. Will vary, yes. Will vary slightly. Yeah. For example, if you didn't have uh, the third derivative, the second derivative of the input, then some of these elements would disappear. If I1 was zero, then this element wouldn't be there. Right. Okay. Cool. Oh, professor? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, my question is, it 
from this diagram, and it mm -hmm. seems that all the A1, A0, A1, and A2 come from the same point. So actually, they're the same or they're the different. A1, A2, and A0 are constants. They are all multiplying the same variable y. Uh, uh, I mean the feedback part. Yes, the feedback part is the same with different gains, but notice that they are going behind different integrals. So some of the feedback will have to be integrated once, twice, or three times. Oh, okay, I got it, thank you. All right, so they are not doing the same thing. Okay, all right, so let's uh, move on and do an exercise. This is looks a bit intimidating at first, but we'll see that uh, everything will fall into that category. Let me just find here my, uh, my correct picture. Huh, I think I messed it up. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Figure one is there. One second. <coughs> okay. I think I messed up my figures here, so let's do that without them. Uh, should be working though. Yeah. Figure one is just not updated. Okay. Oh, fix this and then let's do exercise. There we are. Let's do this exercise here. Uh, blood glucose control system is governed by the following equations. We have a differential equation that is the process itself, how the, the body responds. We have a second equation that relates different internal variables and two more equations that do that. So what are the elements in this equation here? We have R of T is the desired glucose level. So this is the input to our system is the desired glucose level. We have P of T is the current glucose level. So clearly the output of our system. V1 and V2 are amplifier output voltages that operate on the insulin pump. And the insulin pump pressure is here called theta of T. Based on this set of four equations, determine sketch the block diagram of the entire system. Okay, is the problem statement any clear? Any questions about this? This is clearly a system that is controlling a glucose level using a pump. The desired glucose level is the input to our control system because that's what we want to control. <clears throat> the output is the current glucose level and the other elements are intermediate variables there. So let's now represent this in the form of a block diagram. So here we have our four equations and we have the input R of T. The input to the system, why is that the input? Because that's what you're controlling. That's R of T, that's the desired glucose level. That's where we want the system to be. That's where we want the output to go. Desired input, current input. So we want the current input to go to the desired input. This is the output, this is the input. So if that is indeed the case, then we can start with this equation. That's where the input shows up, R of T is our desired input. So let's call here that R of S, which is the same in the frequency domain. And according to this, this, this equation here, the second equation, if we subtract P of S, which is the Laplace transform of P of T, what do we get in the output? V1 T? Um, sorry. Uh, V1. Yeah, V1. Of T or V1 of S as we are dealing with frequency in the diagram. Okay. Now, what do we do? Where do we go? So, this equation 
is done. Where do we go now? We would go from uh, V1 to V2 by multiplying V1 by eight. Exactly. So we go to this equation here where we have V1, an amplifier output to another amplifier output, V2. So if you multiply V1 by eight, we get indeed V2 of S. Yeah, now we are there. What do we do next? Um, multiplying V2 by 0 0.5 to get uh, that um, differential equation. So if you multiply V2 by 0 0.5, what do we get here? We get the derivative of theta dt. All right, so this equation can also be written as theta of s times s equals to 0 0.5 v2 of s. It's the same equation. So by multiplying v2 by 0 0.5, we are left with the derivative of theta dt d theta dt or theta of s times s. So this is theta of s times s. Hmm. Uh -huh. What is the next step? We would want to change theta so it can go into the top equation there. Right. We want to go into the top equation, but now we don't have theta. We have theta times s. So what do we do first? Divide it by an s. Integrate. Yeah. Divide by s. So this dividing by s means we are integrating it, which makes sense, right? Here we got d theta dt. Integral becomes theta of t, in this case, theta of s, because that's what we are considering. So this is that function right there, right? From 0 0.5 to the integral. Now, top equation, that's where theta shows up. So what do we do now? We can't really work with that equation in the time domain because there's derivatives. Let's take the Laplace transform of that. What is the Laplace transform of that equation? Second derivative of P dt becomes P of S, S squared. First derivative of p times 2 is 2p of s times s, and second term, plus 4p of s equals to theta of s. Yeah? Just the Laplace transform of this equation. Now we see the theta of s shows here, <clears throat> shows there. What do we do next? Well, now we can factor out p of s, which is s squared plus 2s plus 4. And this is equal to theta of s. It's a bit hard to see in the screen, isn't it? This color p of s equals to theta of s divided by s squared plus 2s plus 4. And experimenting with new markers, these ones are not the greatest. Is this manipulation fine? This comes from taking the derivative of that. Taking the Laplace yes. transform. Yeah. All right. What do we do now? Uh, multiply by the 1 over s squared plus 2s plus 4. Right, so if you see this equation here, if we take theta of s, divide that by this, we get p of s. So by multiplying that by the inverse s squared plus 2s plus 4, the output there is p of s. This is p of s. And then p of s connects back to the input like that. I'm sorry, Puff. Um, the first term is x of s, right? 
So sorry, say that again. Like the first term is the x of s. There is no x of s. Where where do you see x of s? Like what did you write as the first term? Is this x or pi? This yeah. yeah. It's p p of s. No, um to the left. The first term. R of s? Oh, it looks like x, sorry. <laughs> That's R of S, right? which is the is this equation here, right? It's coming from R of T there. So R of S minus P equals to V1. Questions? I have a question, sir. Yeah. Uh, so I'm assuming that in the next assignment, we're going to have maybe one or two or maybe all questions are in the sense we're going to be taking equations and then putting them into these uh, diagram forms. Uh, mm -hmm. Could we use to make them clearly uh, MATLAB and simulate to yes, lay them up clear? That's the, the goal is actually to actually simulate them in MATLAB. And oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I understand. And also uh, regarding the matrices we were using last uh, class. Uh, and we were learning about, um, are we allowed to do those all, if we like lay out the matrix in for a question and then we, are we allowed to put it into MATLAB and then show the final value or would you want us to go through each of the matrix calculations, matrix calculations? Um, I will see, depending on the question, if the question is complex, I will ask you to, you can do MATLAB. If it's a trivial question and I wanted to check that, then I will, I will specify in the assignment. It, it depends on the complexity of the question. Okay, sounds good, thank you. Okay, so let's do one more. Okay, let's do exercise three. In exercise three, we have two sets of equations and each of these equations have an input. So this represents a robotic system that use an operating room to assist surgeons during operation. An example is a robotic system that controls the position and orientation of an ultrasound probe. The position of surgical arm and the probe can, are given by these equations, where F and G are the desired positions of these arms. A, B, C, and D are constants. Create a single block, block diagram to represent them. Okay. And if you are interested in this type of problems, I do research in this area. I actually had students working on something very similar in addition to other projects on instrumentation and more biological, biomedical engineering oriented. This is more robotics for biomedical. So if you're interested in these things, get in touch with me. You'll find on my lab website, you find me on the on Carlson's page, you see some of the projects that involves things uh, similar to this one. So these two equations represent robotic systems in an operating room. One is holding a tool, one holds an ultrasound probe, and you want to control them. So these are the governing equations for them. And we want to create a block diagram to represent these things. Sorry, today I messed up here my equations, my figures. So let's try to create them. Let's just start with the top one here. We have f of t is one input, x of t is the, is the output of one arm, r of t is the output of the other arm, g of t is the desired position for the other arm, and here we have again y and x. So y and x are the current positions, g and f are the desired positions. So these are the two equations, one for each arm, and you notice that they are interconnected. So let's start with the top equation. We want to create an expression to describe that one. How can we do that? Remember that in the previous example, we isolated for the highest derivative. So we can do the same here. We can take the first equation and rewrite this equation 
as a function of the highest derivative. Well, let's take the Laplace transform. So the fourth derivative is s to the power of four, and that's x of s. And this is equal to f of t minus a s squared x of s minus b s, sorry, x to the power of three, s squared x of s minus c uh, s x of s and minus d times y of s. Right? We, all we did here was to take the Laplace transform and isolate for this. Are How we, come you didn't take the Laplace of the f of t? Uh, f of t, yes, sorry, this is f of s. Good point. This is indeed f of s. All right, so this is the input to this equation. You can start here, f of s. So f of s is the input. What do we do? We want to create this term equation first. So let's now subtract uh, let's just start with let me just think these for logistics. Let's just start here with C times S of S times C S X of S. We are also subtracting B times s squared x of s. We're subtracting a a s to the power of three x of s. And once we are we finish that, we get what do we get? This side of the equation, right? So we added all these terms together. Did I include d? No, I forgot d minus d. Put d coming from the top here, dy of s coming down. And now we have all elements on this side, f minus all of them. What is the result? Uh, I, I is to the power of four x s. Yeah, it's the side of the equation, right? Exactly. So s to the power of four times x of s. So notice that here we need s, x, and all the other derivatives. So what do we do now? We have the fourth derivative of x. We can take the integral by multiplying this by 1 over s. This gives s to the power of 3 x of s. We can take the integral one more time. And what does this give? S to the power of 2 x of s. If you take the integral again and again, we are getting close to finding the output of this equation, which is x. Professor? Yeah? Can you do 1 over s uh, to the power of 4? Yes, uh, we can. But we'll see why that is not a good idea. Okay. Very soon. But we could just do one over s to the power of four, and um, that it should do the same. But there is a but. This is now x of s. Now notice that uh, we established all the parts of our equation. What do we do now? Now we can connect it back. We have all the elements here. We have s to the power of 3 times x of s. This is precisely what we had there. a s to the power of 3 x of s. So we can pick the signal from here, multiply that by a, 
and input it there. That's why it's important to have the derivative. If we add the multiplied by one over S4, then all these intermediate elements would be gone. This one here is B S squared X of S. Where is it? Here, S squared X of S. So if you take the signal there, multiply that by B, that's where we are. Last one here is CX of S times S. So here we have X S of S, take the signal here, multiply that by C and input it there. Okay, so you see now if you only had one S4, these intermediate variables would be gone. We still have the top of the equation here, dy. We are running out of time, but I'm going to finish this so it's in the record. But if you guys have uh, other lectures, feel free to leave. I'll, I'll finish this anyways. And then, as usual, I'll be available after lecture, lecture uh, for consultation if you have any questions. So we still have this dy of s here. Where is that coming from? That comes from the other equation. And the other equation is the bottom equation there, which we can write as the same a s squared uh, times of to the power of three y of s equals to g minus b s squared y of s minus d x of s and this is g of s of course okay so let me just write the equation here and then i will equals to g of s minus b s squared y of s minus d x of s All right that's the equation we just just uh, derived what is the input in this equation the input is g of s so that's a new system they're going to create here with a new input g of s g of s takes minus d times x of s also takes minus b minus b uh, s squared y of s and when you do this three subtractions what we have here we have a s squared i forgot to write the y of s here y of s and then notice that this is multiplied by a so the output here is y of s times a times s to the power of three how do you get rid of that a well simply multiply this by one over a so now we have y squared sorry y of s s to the power of three and now we do the same three integrations one integral two integrals three integrals so y s to the power of three this is y of s s squared this is y s s and this is finally y of s what do we need here we need b is squared y of s so y of s squared b here is from this point multiply that by b and feed the loop
Now, what else we need? Well, we need d times x of s. Where do we get x of s? Well, we get from the top equation all the way up here. So take this point there, multiply that by d, fit in here. What else is left? Well, we have the dy up there. We have, we have taken care of that one, dy. Y can come from all the way here. So if you take this signal, from here, multiply that by D and feed that up there. And this abomination here is the block diagram of these two transfer functions. Okay, and you see that uh, there is no derivatives involved now. All the intermediate variables are available. Output is here, the other output is there. The two outputs, inputs are here and here. And you have these two equations interconnected with, with this loop and that loop. Beautiful, isn't it? All right. I know we are uh, out of time again. If there are any questions, I'll take them. Otherwise, I'll let you go. Does anybody have a question? Uh, yeah, Professor, I have a question here. Mm -hmm. So um, I can I can understand this one, uh, but I want to know uh, generally um, how can we start at this kind of clashing? So the first step is always to start with the input. Okay. And then do all the subtractions, all the uh, preparation to make to get it to the highest derivative of the variable of interest. That's always the same procedure. Okay, I so got you, it. You, so you, you notice that in everything we did, we prepared an equation that it gave that was equal to something times the highest derivative of the variable, right? So first, start by preparing that side of the equation that it will give you equal to the highest derivative. You start from the input because we want to make put, put the input in evidence here. Subtract all the elements that will give you the highest derivative, and then integrate and then connect the back. Oh it's always God. the same procedure. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. So just basically, would it be possible to distill what you just said in like a lecture slide, in terms of like step by step what's the process to get to this like you said abomination <laughs> because like that, that would that would really help me i know um i'm not sure if it's possible to do that yeah we can uh, i can try to add some step by step notes but i would also say that uh you cannot get this wrong if right. you follow the signals if you right. follow the signals it regardless where you start you should be able to come to something that uh, that makes sense. I will do it, but there are really three steps. Yeah. Prepare the equation for the highest derivative. Okay. Isolate for it. Uh, create the uh, right. Let's in this case the right side of the equation with the summation blocks. Okay. You get the highest derivative integrated as many times as required. Right. To get to the variable and then connect signals where they need to go. Prepare equations, cool. isolate for the input. Isolate for the highest derivative of right. the output. The highest, right? Yeah. Okay. And then right side with stun blocks, and what do you say after that? So then do the right side of the equation with the blocks and all the signals that you will take from a generic place. Right. And that will give you then this part of the equation, the highest derivative, then integrate that as many times as needed, one by right. one. Right. And once you do that, you will realize that it will create all the signals you need in this sum that we you just you just did. And then you connect yeah. them back. Yeah. And I and I know that if 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 like because you basically just explained that process through this lecture. So mm -hmm. it also looks like just reviewing that. So yeah, it's, it's not it's not that hard. It's a, it's a bit intimidating when you look at it first, 
but who's yeah who's not there. yeah no i think it is clear you just like described in the lecture slides so thank you yeah. okay no problem all uh, right folks sorry. yeah well, I just have one more quick question. So mm -hmm. here uh, you put the diva S in the very end, I mean, 44 of them. So uh, I just want to know, is this position, is that important or it, it is just to make the graph a little bit neat? Oh, sorry, uh, which one? In... Uh, the, the one on the top, you, you, one? Uh, no, no, no. Oh, you that one, yeah, no, it's just, uh, yeah, just yeah, to, avoid, yeah. to avoid going through all these because I knew it would be a mess. Okay. So okay. I didn't so, want to cross over the others. Okay, so actually the position is not that important. No, okay. it's not important. There's only one way to read this. And if we read this, it will come to the same equation regardless of if it comes to top, bottom, right, left. Okay, okay. It only reads in one way. Okay. All right, folks, that's good for today. I'm 12, I went over time 12 minutes today. That's a new record. Sorry about that. And if you have questions, they'll be available in five minutes for office hours. Okay, have a good day.